I'm Jim Jumbelvo, Dean of the Foster School of Business, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Leaders to Legends, our speaker series. And today we have with us Nancy Zevenbergen, who's the uh, President, CEO, and Founder of Zevenberger Capital Investments. We're going to change the format up a bit. We're going to have a conversation and then we'll leave um, some time for questions. So as we're going along, I'm sure things will occur to you, like, oh, I'd like to know, go into more detail on this or that. Uh, we'll have time for that. So maybe we'll get started and uh, go back to uh, when you were a Husky. So we're very proud that Nancy's uh, 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 an alum of the Foster School. And so what was it like back when uh, you were taking classes in Balmer High? That's true. Um, that's what they called the old building, Balmer High, because it looked like a bad high school. Well, and part of it is um, you had to transition because everybody in that generation, it was Balmer High. That was the business school. And now we're Foster and we've been branded and just much more high level. But um, it was a walk across the street for me. Um, I think when I came to the university, I thought I might be a chemistry major and then a math major and then a forestry major. And then I said, well, Business, that sounds good. Um, and I applied to the Foster School of Business and um, I got in and I went to summer schools because I was an athlete my first, my freshman year and so things were a little bit chaotic that period of time. But um, I had some wonderful professors that um, wanted you to dream. One of the biggest classes I had was if you had to start a business today, what business would you start? And this is when you're sitting in a classroom and I thought, oh my goodness. And I thought, I could take pictures of athletes, you know, because that's what my MO was. And we had to do a business plan for him. And I think he started going earlier that yes, we all could start our own businesses, even back in an undergraduate business program. Yeah. So were you involved in uh, activities while you were a student? I, I was. I played one year for the women's basketball team. Ah. I was a walk-on, not scholarship, so all the drama that we're hearing today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I played with the big basketball, because women still play with the big basketball, but um, I think we finished 16th in the nation at the, that point wow. in time, so that was awesome. But I realized I wasn't ever going to be a professional basketball player and I had to get a job. So going to school going forward was much more important. But it was a great experience. Well, I, th I think you did a, a lot better than becoming a forest ranger or yeah. whatever else. I, uh, personally, when I went to college, I applied to the University of Illinois. I went into the Institute of Aviation. I thought I'd be a pilot. And I had never been on a plane in my life. <laughs> But it sounded good. And then, then I, as we got closer to fall starting up, I realized I've never been on a plane. Right. Maybe I'll try business. And so somewhat similar story. So uh, what, what was your first job after, after, after school. college? So when I was at the university, I worked at Rainier National Bank as a teller, which was on just on the Ave. And um, they had a job posting for an investment intern position basically and it said but you have to have an MBA. I thought, ooh, I only have an MBA. And I'm I'm not even an accounting major, I'm a finance major. Mm -hmm. Accounting majors were more valued back in the day. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I decided to go for it anyway, so I applied. And then I had an uncle um, who happened to know the bank president and I told my uncle I applied for this job but I don't have my MBA. And you know I worked for the company already and I was fortunate enough to get that job in the trust investment department. And I was their analyst for them and I got the um, household products industry and the restaurant industry to follow. And that was kind of the start of my career in the bank investment department. Well, uh, someone told me you guys had a, a major position in Microsoft at that, going back to that era. Back, back when I was in the bank investment department, things, things have changed so much. Um, stability, own the nifty 50 names, the Procter & Gamble's, digital equipment, you kind of, IBM, those kind of names were still back 40 years ago, but an upstart company called Microsoft in our own backyard was coming public. 
And I remember watching Bill Gates walk across the street to go to his initial public offering presentation to investors. And it was like, wow. And so our investment department was a little bit forward thinking and we participated in the IPO that day. And it went up 25 cents because it wasn't in tickers, it was cents. Um, and we sold it because that was such a big move. Lock, lock in that big game. Lock now. in that big game. Um, and I have clients still today from that period of time that laugh with me about, oh yeah, remember when we sold Microsoft the first day after the IPO? And I go, yes, but we bought it back. So, <laughs> um, but it was, it was just a, a wonderful time and it was a marker in my career to see something coming new, a young person, um, not tested by old school people, um, developing a disruptive technology that was gonna be adopted by enterprise businesses. So, uh, uh, how much freedom did you have in your job to uh, recommend uh, in, specific in the, investments? In the trust department? Yeah, in the trust department. Um, recognized trust department is to protect wealth first and yeah. foremost. Um, it Maybe the second is to stay growth above inflation, but for the most part is to protect wealth. And yet many people in the trust accounts, recipients are live and young. Um, so it, it got to a point where for me, I wanted to invite, invest in the Microsofts and the future Microsofts. I thought that was the way to really go. And yet my supervisor was more of a, maybe a technician at one point in time or a value manager. So stepping out on my own made perfect sense because I think I was gonna bring something different to the table of investments at that point in time. So let, let's talk about stepping out on your own. So how, how long were you at um, the bank. Rainier and, and what, what gave you the, the gumption to say, I'm, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna do this on my own? I wasn't making very much money there. Okay, that's a, that's a good motivator. Um, as a woman, I'll kind of go there, um, I was a research analyst and then I was a portfolio manager. And back in the time, I think I managed 100 million in assets. Um, it doesn't take too much to figure out, you know, a rate of return on that and a, and a fee to say, wow, what would it take for me to um, have assets under management on my own to basically make up the salary? And the impetus happened because I was not being promoted to do other things. And I realized I'd be better off making no money for five years and building a business. Um, and I was fortunate enough, some of my live trustees, trust clients came with me. They were able to um, maintain the bank as the trustee, but hire an outside investment advisor. And that was sort of the, the impetus to go. So uh, how long were you? Oh, I was at the bank for six years. Six years. So in six years, you, so you had some client facing oh, yeah. interactions oh, in, yeah. in your position there. So it, what, what was it like at uh, the bank at that time in terms of women getting promoted? I mean, were there any senior okay, women? So let, let's, it's like things haven't changed too much, but go back, because I'm old. Um, when I was hired, they hired three people. And remember, they wanted an MBA, and I was a woman and with an undergraduate degree. Um, the two other people that were hired were both MBAs. One was from California, another gentleman was Asian. So the three of us were kind of their best foot forward of diversity, okay, from that standpoint, because the banks had just had a major lawsuit against them about yeah. how the treatment of women. So that was sort of the, the impetus. Mm -hmm. I, I think the financial services industry, and I, I, have, I met a, a woman here um, who has worked for Dean Witter. <laughs> it, it has a long ways to go to be an equal opportunity employer. How's that? Yeah. It really does. So uh, you're there six years, you decide, okay, I'm, I'm gonna start my own firm. What, what's that like? What do you do? How do you, how, how do you, um, how'd you get the legal advice? How did you get someone to trust you with uh, their finances. significant wealth so you could? So my relationships, I worked at the bank for six years, so I'd, I'd known some of these clients for six plus years. I had referrals from friends whose parents needed some asset management. Um, I had a, um, a major individual um, who came to my home and hired me to manage like $5 million back in the day. Um, and we were sitting at a Formica table in my kitchen. Um, so I was an incredible woman, gave me support um, very early on. 
And from that point in time, assets just started coming in from referrals and another competing money manager, I'll give Badgley and Phelps a shout out here. Um, they knew I was a growth manager, they were more of a value manager. And so they brought me in for an institutional piece of business up in Alaska to be a slice of the portfolio management on a growth side. So what, what's the firm like today? What, 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 are, today? what, are, what are your various uh, products, if, if and you will? We and, and, uh, so we manage $3 billion. Um, three quarters of that money is for institutions. So it's, it's public knowledge, but we manage money for Minnesota, the Chicago Public Teachers. Um, and it's, we are a slice of their total asset allocation, and that slice is definitely in growth. So if, if you want to think of um, names that are headline names that are hated <laughs> because they don't make anybody any money, those are the names we own. So, um, and then the other quarter of our business is high net worth individuals um, that have been working with us for a long time or really want to create wealth, not just maintain it. So if you want to maintain wealth, massive diversification, index funds that are cheap, ETFs that are cheap, great. That is wonderful. If you want to grow your wealth or create wealth, think about diversification. Did Jeff Bezos make his billions by being diversified? Did Bill Gates make his billions by being diversified? No, they owned one company and they created wealth. And so I try and have people to understand I'm in the job of creating wealth for my clients, so we will have a concentrated growth portfolio to go for the next decade, rather than just maintaining wealth, which you can do in today's world incredibly um, cost-effectively. But if, but if someone came to you, and let's say, uh, for sake of argument, they have uh, $50 million of, uh, of assets, would, would you suggest that they invest solely with you, or would you be one piece of the pie of their total investment portfolio? We'd be one piece of the pie. Okay, so you'd be the, the growth piece. Yeah. So you still believe in diversification, except that that's not your piece of, of the pie. Correct. Okay. So um, what, what is your approach to investments? How do you decide, and I think this is the really interesting part, what, what, what's your approach to deciding we're going to take a big position in this firm, and then I want to get into one of the specific firms you're uh, invested in. Okay, so um, we're kind of like yin, yin and yang here. Okay, yeah. here's here's accounting, accounting. <laughs> numbers. Very conservative. <laughs> but numbers, but um, and in, in making a decision based on historic um, information. So you, you get comfortable because the numbers, the cash flow, the earnings have all come through, and I'm comfortable, and I can argue that it's it's valuable or value based investment. Take a step back and look at me. I'm looking at what can be. Okay, what are, what's the total addressable market? What are the millennials doing today differently? Um, are millennials, when they buy a home, are they walking into a bank branch to sign the mortgage documents? Or are they just hitting click, 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 click on their phones? Um, is it currently the, the thing to be when you turn 16 to own a car? Or is it to have the Lyft app and whatever miscellaneous thing on your phone? Um, is the Lyft and Uber dynamic just starting today? And what's it really going to be to the total transportation industry? And um, then take a look for a decade, not for a quarter. So the, the short-term issues, when, when we take an investment with a company, we're hoping to own it for a long time, um, not just to make a trade out of it based on its cheap relative to its peers, because I don't think you can do that. And I also believe companies are, are run by people and they're alive, okay? And you have good cultures and good managements, and you have ones maybe that aren't. And I prefer to have founder-led companies that are committed through ownership of the stock versus, I call them rent an MBA, but it's really not so much that. It's that the board hires an outside person, but a board may only give them three years to drive the business, and that's not enough time. A founder-led company um, can really make decisions for a decade. And a lot of the things that are happening today were decisions that were made 10 years ago. 
So I, I just think um, I'm looking forward at total addressable markets and revenue growth. And the other thing that we look differently is um, we look at the private companies and if you think private companies, they come public or there's an M&A um, or they, you know, some kind of sell, what valuation metrics are those in that private venture world? And it tends to be top line top line first, and total addressable market, it, it is not PE ratios, okay, because they don't have earnings yet, usually you can't go that direction. So there's there's a difference. So what do you, what do, you do when a founder leaves, like, I mean, do you, do you go, oh, Bill Gates is leaving Microsoft, time to get out of that stock, or Howard Schultz is leaving Starbucks, uh, we'll go on to Time to get in, else. just kidding. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> Actually, Sorry. Very, actually, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, when a founder leaves, it is a problem. It would be a flag for us. But let's let's talk about um, Uber, private company. Uh, Mr. Klatnik kind of hit the press. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Okay. The board removed him. Um, and who did they bring in? Someone local from Expedia, Dara. Right. Mm -hmm. That was a good hire. <laughs> that was so, um, I invested privately in Uber with Klatnik and he was gone, I was like, oh my goodness. And then they bring in Dara and I'm thinking, oh my goodness. <laughs> and then we're now getting ready, they just announced this morning that they will be coming public. Um, so is it founder led? No, but is it um, someone who's brought them through a very difficult time and hopefully has massive stock incentive to drive the business? So how do you get to know the leaders of the companies that you um, invest in? Because, okay. I mean, yeah. you're not invested in five or six companies, yeah. you're invested in a, a ton. And actually, I, maybe you could talk about your team and yeah. how, how you assign things, things in your right. office and who looks at what. Okay, I'll talk about my business itself. Okay, we have 18 people. Um, five portfolio managers, we have uh, seven CFAs, chartered financial analysts, specific to doing analysis, so it's sort of like getting your MBA, but in the financial services industry. Um, we do divide by um, sectors, so consumer discretion, um, technology, durables, um, you know, cannabis, we just talk about the Wild West here. Um, so I think um, we have a really uh, ability to get in depth and apply our philosophy and what we're looking for in a company by the depth of the people that we have. And because we don't have a 200 name portfolio, you know, our goal is for the core portfolio is 30 to 50 names and we're running about 34 names. Um, we have a concentrated portfolio <coughs> that has 10 names. Um, with my belief that if you have a long enough time frame, you can deal with the short-term volatility, okay? And the biggest sell decision you have is not to sell, um, to stay invested. So you brought in two partners in the ensuing years since uh, you started the company, Brooke and, and Leslie. How, how do you uh, apportion your duties? We all sit in the same room. And, oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an open concept because I'm not one for meetings, um, and public speaking isn't my gig either, um, but we sit in a room and we trade information immediately. We're, we're evaluating when news comes up and what's happening within the companies. Um, I defer to my teammates if they're sector specific. So Leslie does healthcare, and she actually came from the banking industry, so she does financial services. Um, Brooke does, um, it's so funny, what, what was the old school utilities, but she also does consumer discretionary, and she's, we call her buyout Brooke. Every time she goes on vacation, one of her companies gets bought out. So yeah. it's pretty good, fun. Very interesting. So do you think there's a different culture in, a, uh, I mean, the three top employees are all women, and that's very different from most investment firms. Do you, do you think that's impacted your investment style or the culture of the firm or the types of clients you attract? I think... Um, we are a great diversifier to someone's portfolio just because we may look at things differently than the other half of the population. Um, but more so because we're a growth manager. 
And I, I think the ego set aside, is put at the door, we're a team and um, we want the strongest teammates. So whether you're a basketball team or a football team, you know, there's the punter and there's the quarterback and everything else. We, we have the same thing and we want the people that are the very best at those skill sets. So we have people that are client service. Um, in today's world, yes, we have someone who's assigned the social media job. <laughs> and it's tough because the financial services industry is regulated and has to be very compliant for whatever you can say. Um, so that if you guys ever did a vertical in social media and compliance um, for the financial services industry, I think you'd get a lot of people who'd want to take your courses. So I know you're a very patient investor, but uh, not all of your clients, I, I would imagine, are as patient as you are. And so what do you do when they're starting to get impatient about uh, some of the firms in your portfolio and and you're, you want them to hold on for the, the long term? We are a performance-driven firm. So um, I think our last... 10-year rate of return is like 18%. In fact, look in the Wall Street Journal, we did yeah. really, really good. Um, but and, we've and had- Who do you benchmark against? Uh, Russell 3000 Growth right. Index. Um, so, but we've had periods of severe underperformance, um, severe. And that is where I work hard. It's where we go in and we say, yes, you guys are familiar with Netflix and Quickster? Remember that whole debacle? Um, we had to go in front of our clients and say, it is more than Quickster, and they believe streaming is the direction we're gonna take. And they've made this move, and even though they didn't execute the, the breakup between mail order and streaming, um, they did the right thing. And we spent a lot of time in front of clients because it caused us to severely underperform for a period of time, mm. okay? And now it's probably been one of a, our largest capital contributor to our clients' portfolios in the last decade. Well, I know you've had periods of extreme overperformance too. I don't, right. Forty percent okay. returns. So I, I, tell us a little. Uh, yeah. A little bit of history. Okay, let me just say. Um, Bull and bear market. I was going to give this to you. I'm going to give it to Jim. So hopefully the school will have it. We can um, post it. What is the average bull market in the last, since 1926? The average time frame of bull market? Does anybody have a guess? 9.1 years. What's the average period of a bear market? One and a half years, the average period. So if you think you can market time, a correction, good luck getting back in. Uh, and it shows this beautiful graph of blues, bull, reds, bear, and the bear markets are severe. They're down 40%. Um, but the fact is market timing I don't think works. Um, therefore, put, put, recognize you will have a bear market. You will have market corrections. Put that aside and say, what kind of companies do I want to invest alongside that are gonna change businesses. So I, I gotta read this, okay? Yeah, yeah. You guys have so much information available at your fingertips online. Just go to the company's websites and read the CEO's letters, especially they're all just coming out from last year. Um, but this is a CEO's letter that actually puts their letter in from 1996, okay? Um, and it says, our employee base grew from 158 people to 614. We significantly strengthened our management team. Today, this company has 647,000 employees, okay? They also said, it's not easy to work here. Um, when I interview people, I tell them, you can work long, hard, or smart, but here, you can't choose two out of the three. This is what he wrote almost 30 years ago. Then they said, really excited, Amazon had a great 1997, now I told you who it was. Sales grew from 15 million to 147 million, up 800%. Today, their revenues are 232 billion. But you can go to their website, read Jeff Bezos' letter from 1996, read his letter from last year, and recognize he's building a business for the future. Um, and then all the headwinds that we hear and the horrible things, you know, that they're awful. Um, put that aside and look, you're investing alongside a company for long term. So culture is really important. And then the other one I have that, because um, I like to talk about it, is this company called Netflix. And they um, put a company culture piece out, you know, what it's like to work here. And you get a flavor for the management team. Now, if we lose Reed Hastings, 
that would be a loss because I think he's driven and, and sent that in, that company. And his number two guy is really the content media person, the one that's Hollywood, I would say. But um, take a ch opportunity before you do any numbers and read about the culture of the company. Read about the culture of the company and the management team. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And the last one I'm gonna encourage you to read, and this is an investment for value investors. Okay, Okay. so Jamie Dimon, JP Morgan. JP Morgan, Banker's Bank. Um, he does, yeah, it's a 50 page piece. Um, amazing outlook about his business, the, comp the global, opportunities, the challenges that we have as Americans. Um, I wouldn't say he's political, he's, he's, he's middle of the road, he, he both sides of it. But it's a fascinating um, document that if you ever need a little hint of what's going on in the world, it's better than anything you're gonna hear on CNN, okay? It's one of the, my coolest letters to read um, from a character of the company, and if it was more of a growth stock, I'd be all over it. Um, but it's great for those income-oriented clients. Well, let's talk about another growth stock I think you're invested in, that's Tesla. So Tesla, since you're going after accountants, now I gotta go. Uh, if you, so this is one of the, I mean, the companies with, I think, the largest short interest in uh, of companies that we're familiar with. How do you stay invested in a company when there's all this negative stuff and, you know, to some extent related to the CEO, and I, I know you believe that the CEO makes a big difference in the right. success of a company. Okay, so Elon Musk, what was the first company he was known to have found? Anybody know? PayPal. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> See, I got, I'm working on it. Um, then he wanted to change the world as far as um, green, right? So here comes an electric vehicle and um, he's getting transportation by doing a tunnel. But what's also fascinating, while he was doing the electric vehicle drive, he was putting rockets in the air. Um, taking over for NASA by putting satellites in the sky. And to me, one of the decisions with this gentleman was, if he could put rockets, he sure could seem to be able to do an electric car. <laughs> I mean, to me, rockets would be a lot more difficult, right? And I remember someone saying to me, oh no, rockets are easy. I was like, okay, great. Um, we invested in Tesla um, partially because we had exited our position in Apple. Apple was no longer growing, total addressable market. We probably sold it too soon, but it wasn't, it was big. Steve Jobs did pass away and that was, we felt a challenge. Yeah. Um, but we were looking for, for our clients something in the portfolio that was similar and, and what we found, we felt was, maybe this electric car is an expensive PC. Um, and we looked at the Elon Musk um, documents and they were still only selling the Roadster at the time we took the investment. Um, the S was literally a prototype. Um, so we've kind of been through financing, debt, blah, 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 for how many years? What, eight years? Yeah. Seven years. Um, and he keeps executing against huge, huge hurdles. The incumbent labor practices of Detroit. Um, if Bob Lutz gets up on CNBC and starts saying how horrible Elon Musk is again, he's the former, I think, chairman of GM. GM. Um, I, I just go, they brought Lutz out again. Is that the best the shorts can do? Yeah. Um, and recognize um, that I believe we will go to electrification and uh, autonomous driving. And I believe that Elon Musk and Tesla are leading the pack. And do they have a huge opportunity internationally? Yes, well in the meantime, the US is fighting with China. They're building a plant in China. So um, just, I'm in it for the long term. Um, what's interesting, kind of inside here, is my son um, was the engineer who developed the first manufacturing drivetrain for the Model S. Um, wow. So he's a gadget guy. And um, it's just, he, he even said this car is phenomenal. You know, it's just amazing what it can be do, can do. So I, I look at Elon Musk at this point in time as something in our generation that we'll want to remember uh, for a long time. Well, given when you invested, I mean, you made a lot of money for your clients. Right, you but you know, we're down, it, we're down 25, 30% yeah. from its high, but yeah. I'm in it for the next decade. Okay. So, 
What, what happened in 2008? You know, we talked about your, your clients maybe panicking a little bit, and so we have a massive downturn in 2008. How, how did you manage your portfolio? How did you manage your clients? Um, we had to go back, and I call it um, confessions of a growth manager. Um, and as we look long term, at what point was there a bubble in the valuations? And I think um, we had to reevaluate every single company. Did they have the cash available to continue to grow the business or access to capital to grow their business, to go through the downturn? Were they going to use the downturn as an opportunity to grow their business? Sometimes negative situations are an opportunity to gain market share, and um, were managements able to do that? And again, we go back with our clients. We grow and invest for a decade. We're looking for total addressable markets and revenue growth. In fact, if I had to say, what are the fundamental factors we look at for an investment? Revenue, revenue, revenue. Because in the end, it drops to the bottom line. If your revenue is not growing, your bottom line is not going to grow. Um, so we really want to focus on that and we talked to our clients and we held a lot of hands. So uh, Warren Buffett is uh, kind of famous for saying he wouldn't invest in Microsoft because he didn't understand it. And are, are there any growth areas that you stay away from because you just think they're, they're too complicated to understand, whether it's biotech I, or? I think biotech's really hard. Um, basically, they're negative, negative cash flow for per perpetuity until, yeah. and then if they get an approval for a drug, do they ramp up manufacturing and get sales going? So it's, it's tough. Um, if medical, we'd rather go medical devices, and that's still not easy. Um, Warren Buffett, um, I get a kind of a kick because he's the he's the other side of me too but you know he did take an investment in Apple um, he's a little late but uh, yeah. <laughs> but he did do that and he did a joint venture with Amazon and JP Morgan for Street health initiative healthcare. called Haven so um, even in his ways, he's probably looking at some of his um, tenants, and he ch I think he did just change one of his tenants of investing yeah. um, to look more at top line growth. Well, you know, you know, obviously you've got a very busy lifestyle. You've got to get into work. You and your team are, you know, watching where things are going all day long. How, how, how and you've been at this a while, how do you balance uh, work and life? And family. <laughs> um, I have an incredibly supportive spouse. We both started our businesses from the basement of our home. So um, he has a business too. Yeah, he was a building construction major. Now it's called something of construction management. Yeah, from the UW. Um, so he was out, um, you know, getting loans to do spec housing, and I was talking to clients on the phone about the stock market. Um, and um, we had support. Um, we have housekeepers, and um, when we had kids, we had people help get our kids around too. So um, that's I balance that. I don't do a lot of. Other things, um, now I have adult children, so that's a little different animal, and I have grandchildren. Um, I think God laughs, I have six grandsons and one granddaughter, and she is the queen. Wow. So, <laughs> so um, balance work and life, I love what I do so it doesn't tire me out. Um, I get up in the morning and we've been waiting and waiting for the um, IPO market to come, all these companies that have been private for so long, um, because it is food for our clients portfolios. It's something we really look at. Well, maybe I'll ask one more question and we'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, what about international investments? Is, do, you, do you just focus on the U.S. market or are there any companies uh, abroad that you're interested in? It is a global marketplace and I know people want to slice and dice and say, you know, we're taking, we're long China and we're going Taiwan and we're going, you know, private venture in some Botswana land. Um, Large companies, even small tech companies, become global immediately. You know, they're selling their software globally immediately. Um, I think the information transference is just so much better than it was 30 years ago. So we have comfort in actually owning international companies, um, especially if they're in similar lines like we have a company called Mercado Libre. We call it the Amazon of Brazil, South America, Venezuela, had some horrible currency issues there. Um, Canada is like Is, is that a company traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Exchange? Yeah, it's traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, Canada is kind of like we call it North America. So, you know, is Lululemon an international stock? 
I don't think so. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's, it's that concept. Do we actually go really aggressively looking for growth names in Europe or China? Not particularly. Great. We got a lot of great companies here. You do. Um, all right, turn it over to the audience. First question. Um, how active is your firm in the governance of the corporations that you're invested in? What are your thoughts on that? Okay, we are not, um, quote unquote, um, as active as some managers who basically that's what they say. So we, we do vote, vote the proxies. We have an ESG analyst, so environmental, social, and global analyst who does a review of a lot of documents to say, okay, here's, here's our buy checklist. And we've done this check too. Um, I vote with my feet, I'll be honest with you. And, and part of me is a governance. I'm not necessarily in favor of some of the direction that the upper echelons say this is the governance. For example, um, board members that can't be family members or you know need to be all this diversification. I'm like, I need a board that can make decisions with the management team to be competitive and, and make quick decisions. You know, So I founder-led, concentrated, holdings I like. That's kind of opposite of what the direction of governance is going right now. Two questions. Sorry. One's an easy one, I promise. Okay. Um, one, just out of curiosity, um, can you talk a little bit about your demographic for your clients in terms of like, are they mostly located here locally in Seattle or ages, things like that? I'm not sure how diverse it okay. is. And then the second question is, how do you approach or have you in any of the company of clients that you've worked with invested in more new technologies, so AI, AI blockchain, um, and machine learning, things like that? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a she, mic back okay. there, do we, Steve? Um, she asked me about the demographic makeup of my clients um, and then about kind of new technologies, blockchain and AI. Um, so 75% of my clients are institutional, so there's no age there. <laughs> They're in perpetuity. Um, the, the clients that are high net worth individuals or individuals range from uh, 22 years old to... We have a 95-year-old client who still is investing in High growth. growth. Wow. <laughs> High growth client because she doesn't need the money. It's for her kids. Right. Um, very different animal. Um, and the 95-year-old has been with me for 30 years, So, um, which is kind of interesting. We have a client that hired me when they were 22. Um, student at the University of Washington when I first started my business and is still a client with me today and he's an executive of a major corporation. So um, women versus men, um, I have some amazing men clients and I have some amazing women clients, just want to say that. Um, and people who took a risk um, by giving me their money to manage as a, a young startup growth manager. Um, the AI, all that good stuff. Um, I had to do a talk on um, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Oh Lord, that was yeah. awful. Um, and uh, you know, it's um, the blockchain obviously has some benefits um, for transactions and and mod it. But who's going to win? Is is it going to be a um, a current tech company or is it going to be a bank? Jamie Jamie Dimon was pretty funny on that one too, by the way. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. I'm not investing directly in that. Um, what was the other one you asked? AI, blockchain, eh. tech companies yeah, high, are all- Super high tech. Super high tech. You know, who knows what Google's doing in the background? You know, they are investing in so many things that we do not see because everyone focuses on, did you Google it? You know, their advertising budget. Yeah. They, let me just say, they are a scientific entity though. Major things going on. So a question in the back. Ellie? We talk a lot about culture. What are some of the key sort of human characteristics of culture I do believe um, a corporate culture, a successful corporation, has to have the client first. Okay? Um, I know some people say the employee is first. But unless you're focused on providing the client with an extraordinary experience, I don't think you'll be successful. Um, then you gotta take care of your employees. You gotta educate them. You gotta make sure that um, they can focus on the job at hand and not worry about their healthcare. Um, I think, um, 
in the changing world that we're in, um, the re-education of the workforce is a big deal. I think it's gonna be a huge market going forward. Um, you know, education, and here we're sitting in a four-year institution, six-year institution. Um, I just think, watch what happens to education and its delivery over the next six years. I think it's gonna be huge and changing. This is the end of my term as dean, so that's for the next person to. But you know, <laughs> he knows it. No, I mean, we've gone to an online program and uh, I, I think there's gonna be a lot of changes in, yeah. in higher ed. Yes, ma'am. have to stay positive, and, but I love what I do. I love following the markets and, and stocks. I mean, I get a kick out of it, and, and seeing people who have ideas to create something that is, is different. Okay, so electric vehicles, I mean, that is just a fascinating subject to watch every day. Um, setbacks, I manage $3 billion, and you might say, well, that's big. I've been in business for 30 years. It's a failure. Um, I have people, competing my competitors who manage 10 billion or 12 billion dollars and their numbers are not even close to mine as far as returns for their clients. So that's a setback, but I'm just gonna keep going um, and get the word out. And I um, recognize you in education is always taught about in arrears. You know, read all the, uh, what's the what's the revenue going back? What's the earnings? Are they cash flow positive? You know, and I'm saying today, can they fund their growth? Maybe not through cash flow and earnings, but through SoftBank. <laughs> through, through, you know, there's other methods of funding today that are different from just generating cash flow from the entity. And, um, I think that's the hardest thing I have to talk to clients about to say it works. Yes, sir. How do you manage your growth portfolio where the returns can be kind of non-linear? And you're in this for the long term, so how do you decide when it's actually time to cut capital from a position and exit versus trying to wait for maybe that spark where you can get that Um Okay, so we want to put a company on kind of watch if we have an executive shakeup. Okay, <laughs> or a change that we're not real comfortable with. Um, with looking at price to sales, for example, it's industry specific, so software as a service, SaaS companies, um, in the pullback they got down to four and five times revs. Um, when you started having buyouts, they go at 17 times revs. If you have companies come to the public marketplace today like Lyft and Uber and even Pinterest coming out, um, Pinterest might be looking at more at four to five times revs. Um, Lyft might be seven times revs. If a company starts going up at 17 times revs, which I know hasn't been a buyout valuation, I'd want to peel some. So that's more, more of my metric. At the same time, if it's gotten to a size in the portfolio, like eight, nine, 10, 11%, do I take some off the table? Yes. And also, there's some new companies, new growth companies for the next decade that we wanna buy. Um, so, and because we're fully invested, we're always looking at that. Yes. So I'm curious, what, um, I mean, I, I get a lot of this is very, uh, it's based on your wisdom and your experience and subjective in some ways, and looking at things that aren't art. art. That's, that's <laughs> as much as something. Yeah. And, and, aren't, and, and they aren't necessarily data-driven in plastic sense, but, Um, we have access to Bluberg. Um, obviously all corporate documentation we read. Um, we have a model that we've put in place which gives you high and low relative valuations historically of that type of a company. Um, and we can compare companies across industries. Um, Bloomberg is an incredibly powerful tool that I don't think I have the capability of even using 10% of what it can do from a, a data collective. And again, another, uh, do you guys have Bloomberg's here? Yeah, we do. Yeah, um, such an amazing tool from an investment standpoint. In the back. For new 
new technologies. Um, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not a software engineer. Um, so you have to look at their clients and their revenue streams and potentially what people are also investing in. Um, it, Take it more simply. Uh, Peter Lynch, familiar, ring a bell there, Peter Lynch? Understand what a company does. And if it's not in my skill set to understand very complex sciences, I'll step away. Um, Uber and Lyft, is that pretty easy for you guys to understand? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Facebook? Now, some people say, no, it wasn't. I mean, we, there's, there's an, one came public and we invested in it. We had young people in our staff who grew up using social media and we participated and the stock immediately went down, what, 40%? Mm -hmm. And boy, did we get taken to task by our clients on that. And we continued to buy. Now, it's common knowledge, it's fang. It's like, how did you, you know. Um, it was a new technology, but it was a form of communication that was changing the world and how we do things. So um, that was easy to understand. What's interesting in this business world, you guys, no one's brought it up and I kind of threw it out there, but um, uh, new industry, the cannabis industry. And um, I'm not a user, I haven't been a user, I don't know anything about it, but um, as an alternative to the pharmaceutical industry, it is huge, huge. And you talk to 60 year olds with arthritis that, oh yeah, yeah, I use cannabis cream. Oh yeah, I've used the tincture. And you, you just hear this going on. And it's been a suppressed industry from the government. Um, it's a, what, class one mm -hmm. opioid drug like heroin. Um, I think if you guys are looking for jobs, <laughs> You go to Privateer Capital down in Seattle, who is the founder um, and of Tilray, which is our local domestic cannabis provider. Fascinating industry that is probably going to change um, and grow dramatically here in the next 10 years. It's maybe what Microsoft was 40 years ago. Well, other questions? Well, let me say to you that this is a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, really, personally, glad to have a better understanding of your company. I got to start thinking about where I'm putting my retirement money, maybe a little, little more in growth, not as conservative as I have been. But thank you so much for being with thank us. Um, can, I, can I say one thing? I want to um, thank Jim. Um, I've been in business with foster grads for 30 years, and Jim came to our office, what was it, 10 years ago? 10 years, 10 years ago. ago. First representation from the University of Washington that came and said, wow, I didn't know. Um, and I just want to say what an honor that was to be recognized by my institution. Um, and Jim did that for us. So a huge supporter of, of, of women businesses. And thank you so much. Thank you. That was nice of you to say that. Thank you.